<laughs> for Brian Flores, the shelf life was three seasons. No playoff appearances, but yeah. I thought they were making progress. Apparently, Stephen Ross did not. The Dolphins making the move today. And let me just make the big picture observation. Because we processed this in real time earlier. Miles Simmons joined me while we were just kind of wading through the weeds of what happened after this. My general position as it relates to coach and general manager. You either fire both, like the Vikings and Bears did today, or you keep both, like pretty much every other team did today. Getting rid of one and keeping the other is a recipe for dysfunction and or evidence of dysfunction. Because what that message sends, and this isn't all that difficult to figure out. The fact that I figured it out is proof that it's not all that difficult to figure out. For some of the billionaires and oligarchs that own NFL teams, it is difficult to figure out. And when you're an absentee owner like Stephen Ross, it becomes impossible to figure out. When you have the possibility for the GM to stay and the coach to go or vice versa, you're letting everyone know moving forward that when the crap hits the fan, and it inevitably will, there is benefit to playing the game behind the scenes, to put the blame on this guy before he can put the blame on you and pit one against the other and the owner sides with one and the other one is gone. That is poisonous. That is toxic. Stephen Ross, you probably don't pay attention to what we have to say. I know you're aware of the website. I don't know if you pay attention to the videos, the show, or whatever, but let me tell you something. You're screwing this thing up when you get rid of one and keep the other. Get rid of both or keep both because the coach and the GM always need to be at every team under the impression that they both succeed or they both fail. They both stay or they both go. And if there's a path for one to stay and one to go, when you hit rough spots, that's when one is going to try to throw the other one under the bus and vice versa. And that's what happened today. That's what happened. I don't need to hear people reporting, oh, there was a power struggle. Of course there was a power struggle. If the coach is out and the GM stays, something not right is going on. And yet again in Miami, something not right is going on. So... That's I'm, that's all I'm, I'm going to say about it. Well, I'm not sure, Mike, what Chris Greer has done to keep his job seventh to keep go a seventh season. He's 47 and 51 postseason appearance, and that was his first uh, year that he was there. He's hired Adam Gase and and Brian Flores and fired them both. So, I, what has he done to tell you that he has the organization going the right direction? I mean, they've had winning records each of the last two seasons. So, I, I don't know. And I'm with you. I think you pair the two together. You have a GM and you have a coach. You do it like the 49ers did. You hire both and you commit to them and you think they're the right people and you put them in place and you let them go for however long they need to go to get it done. And the Dolphins just haven't been able to do that. I mean, they've just changed coaches too much they haven't gotten the quarterback position right which almost every one of these firings that we're going to talk about today that's the one ingredient that's been the same for all of them they cannot get the quarterback position right and the 49ers in my view are a little bit different because Kyle Shanahan runs this show there John Lynch works for him so if they hadn't made the playoffs this year, for example, I was wondering, would Kyle Shanahan throw John Lynch under the bus and hire a new GM? Maybe. The chances of Shanahan being fired and Lynch staying very, very slim. I just think this is a good old-fashioned internal tug of war where and, – and this is what drives coaches crazy. I know this. One of the things I've learned over the last 20 years, they hate the idea that they're down there busting their ass on the sideline – and there are people in the luxury suite whispering to the owner and criticizing everything the coach does, and you develop factions, and you develop alliances, and you develop fiefdoms, and you develop agendas. And God forbid Brian Flores acted like a coach acts sometimes. He's focused on winning. He didn't go to finishing school in 15 years with Bill Belichick. When you're with Belichick all that long, you start to pick up the ways that he projects, and he's prickly and no nonsense and not big on relationships it's not about relationships when I saw that they were leaking that stuff to guys like Jeff Darlington from ESPN I almost puked pardon my language not that that's anything all that bad it's just a little graphic at dinner time on a Monday but it's not about relationships what the hell 
It's about winning football games. It's about having the right atmosphere in place to win football games. And when the owner doesn't work there, and the owner is hearing everything secondhand, and the owner isn't in a position to evaluate the coach every day, and the coach is busy busting his ass. I know I said a couple of minutes ago, that's all I'm going to say about it. Well, I got more to say. And the coach is busting his ass, and he's not in a position to go kiss the owner's ass or play the games that take you away from what you need to do, which is focus on putting the best product on the field, creates a situation where people in the front office who are threatened by Brian Flores don't like the way he acts, don't like the way he talked to me, don't like what he said, whatever, whatever. They, they, they gang up on him, and they, they poison the owner against him, and because the owner barnstorms in for games and then goes back to New York, he never knows the difference. And it's sad. I mean, Stephen Ross has got to be in his 80s now. It's not like he's going to have some epiphany at this point. He just doesn't get it. And uh, congratulations. He's made billions in real estate. That's great. But with his football team, it's been a disaster. And one of the reasons it's a disaster is he doesn't live there, he doesn't work there, and he allows himself to be played by people in the organization who have agendas and who act out on them. And I believe that's exactly what happened in Miami. Well, and if you're going to make those decisions, Mike, and let people influence, you need to be in the building every day. You need to be a Jerry Jones type owner when you show up every day, when you sit in those meetings. And I know Jerry has the general manager tag in Dallas, but at least he's there and aware of what's going on internally every single day. You can't just show up every once in a while and know what's going on because somebody does get your ear and somebody does influence you. I mean, this is an organization that hasn't had a coach for four full seasons since Dave Wonstadt. They changed coaches all over. Six coaches since Dave Wonstadt that they've had, and that's not counting all the interim coaches that they've had. So you've got to find a head coach that's going to work with your general manager and, and you're going to win with, and you're, it's going to be a long-term relationship. And again, you've got to get the quarterback position right, and who knows if they have that or not. But... Brian Flores is going to find a job somewhere else. He's been, a, a, to me, a really good head coach in Miami. They've had back-to-back -back winning seasons. Got unlucky at the end of the season. I know they got blown out by Tennessee. They played hard yesterday. I mean, the Patriots were playing to win that game, 4-2 and two against New England in his career. So they were doing a lot of things right and looked like they were on the right track. And maybe they hire somebody who can get them over the hump. Who knows? But I think Brian Flores is a very good coach. Yeah, and look, the question for Brian Flores now is to assess and select and choose carefully because you get one more shot as a practical matter. I think the days of Nora Turner and Wade Phillips That's are right. over where you get three shots. I think you get two. So you better wait, even if it's a year or two, maybe three, find a spot where you can go be successful, reestablish yourself, go back to New England if you need to, and wait for the right opportunity where you can go and have a better outcome, where you can go and work for an owner where you know that everything is going to work out and you're going to have time and the owner is going to be there every single day. The owner is invested. You know, for the fans, for the people in the organization, the team is the most important thing. You know, for a lot of fans, it's, it's, it's all they think about. It's all they follow. And when the owner doesn't behave the same way, it just sends a bad message. And I also think that when the owner relies upon the people who are telling him things during games when the coach is otherwise coaching the team. It's not fair to the coach. And, uh, and, and Stephen Ross has to live with it. He's the one that's got to go forward now with a new head coach, and we'll see what they do. We'll see what they do with the quarterback. I've heard mixed things on whether or not Brian Flores did or didn't want Deshaun Watson. Now you've got Stephen Ross saying he doesn't want Deshaun Watson. Well, he's the guy who wanted Deshaun Watson. He wanted Deshaun Watson. He wanted Tua Tonga-Vailoa. And I can't imagine that they've come to the conclusion in firing Brian Flores that Tua is the answer because that team had a winning record this year do much more to the efforts and skills and abilities of Brian Flores than it did do the efforts, skills, and abilities of their starting quarterback. And anyone who doesn't see that, I don't know what to tell you. You're just wrong if you don't see it that way. And, Shireen, as we say, dysfunctional teams – do dysfunctional things and yeah. welcome to the dysfunction if you're a fan of the Miami Dolphins because here it is it's not a new development it's just another bit of evidence to further prove that your favorite team is a stew of dysfunction five consecutive years without a playoff berth Mike and I just don't get it because who wouldn't want to live in Florida in South Florida weather's terrific there's no no state income tax 
Now, next year, they're going to have over $70 million in cap space estimated, but that'll be first in the NFL to go spend. They have three first-round picks over the next two years, and I don't believe Stephen Ross for a second when he says they no longer have interest in Deshaun Watson. I would almost guarantee you they want Deshaun Watson, and they will make a play for him in the offseason. I'll be very surprised if that doesn't happen, Mike. Well, you know, because they've seen what happens when you create expectations and you don't deliver, what a problem it is. And frankly, once the trade deadline came and went and the Deshaun Watson talk ended and Stephen Ross forgot about it and it no longer hovered over the team, what happened? They started winning football games. So, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he's learned that taking Deshaun Watson off the table helps the football team, although embracing (laughs) Tua Tonga-Vailoa as the long-term answer isn't going to help the team either. Sorry, Tua and on, but... The, the, the And it's funny because fans, fans of teams who don't like it when people who aren't among them point out the things they're concerned about, they get resentful. We're trying to make your team better. We're trying to point out the things that need to be done to help the team. And you should be very pissed off today that Brian Flores is no longer the head coach and you should be resigned to the fact that until Stephen Ross sells the team, it's going to be same thing. It's the instructions on the shampoo bottle. Lather, rinse, repeat. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.